Greetings and welcome back. We are in Senior AP English and our objective for the hour now is to finish with our conversations regarding Wordsworth and more particularly Ten Turn Abbey. I want to just review where we've been so that we can then pick up with your notes from there. Wordsworth's presentation of the romantic ideology is best presented in Ten Turn Abbey. The poem is a poetic essay that understands a movement from past to present to future. We've already kind of looked at the beginning of the poem. Uh, the beauteous forms have not been to me in their absence as is the landscape to a blind man's eye, but often lonely rooms and mid the den of towns and cities, I've owed to them sensation sweet, felt in the brain, etc., etc. Now, uh, you'll remember yesterday that Wordsworth argued it's little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love that defined a great person's life. And then the challenge is to say, how does one find the energy to do that uh, continuously? And for him, it is being in nature. It is with this break, and so I dare to hope, that we then move into the present and start thinking about the future. Wordsworth is going to draw a comparison between what it was like when he was young, dizzy, right, that dizzy youth idea, I'm, I'm with you on page 787, and what it is like now that he is an older man who is going to spend his time with lofty thoughts. I'm with you on 787. Let's go back now to uh, take a look at uh, what, it, what it is now that he's saying on this topic. Nor for this line 85 or so, nor for this faint I, nor mourn, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed for such loss, I would have believed, abundant recompense. A way to say this for your notes is, Wordsworth says, I lost some things, but I also gained some things. Okay? Really? What is it that you gain? Well, I'm getting older, I'm getting wiser, he says. I've learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth. He will define youth as thoughtless. But he will point out, when you're young, you can just enjoy the experiences of being in nature, and you don't have to think about it all the time. It is a function of being older that we're always trying to give words to the experiences. Some of you are about to live through this last 50 days of your senior year, where you're going to constantly feel like you have to start using words. This will be the last time I, and then you fill in the blank. This will be the last time, this will be the last time I do this, this will be the last time. It's interesting to ask, why weren't you saying that as a junior? Why is it you have to wait until a senior to start kind of thinking in those terms? Well, because I realize a monumental rite of passage is about to happen for me, and I'm emancipated from this, for lack of a better term, whole. Uh, and uh, so I'm excited about that. As we get older, we want to qualify things more. Notice he'll continue by saying, but hearing often the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to say, chasten and subdue. And I felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts. Again, back to this notion, there's two kinds of thinking. This is very platonic. There's the thinking everybody does. And then there's this thinking that Wordsworth says he's called to elevated thoughts. The thoughts that transcend the first box, if you will. Back to our uh, box on the board, our Platonist uh, form theory box. A sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns in the round ocean and the living air. All of these obviously fitting in the first box and the blue sky and in the mind of man. A motion and a spirit, there's the word, that impels, that is to say, challenges all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Now this is pure romanticism, we don't want to miss it. We use the word today simply energy. That's our use, okay? There is something about Ruthie's tree that makes it quite remarkable. It is energy, in the same way that you are energy. There is a sense to try to somehow separate ourselves from Ruthie's tree. We're somehow quite distinctly different. At our core, Wordsworth will say, not so. All life is animated with this energy, and it's invisible. Of course, Plato will use the word soul, won't he? Here he uses, Wordsworth uses the word spirit, and everything is interfused with this. The fact that for Wordsworth, he will come more face to face with this when he's in na with nature is going to be foundational to the romantic view. OK? 
Okay. Notice he'll continue, therefore, am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and all that we behold from this green earth of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what we have created and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. Now, this is, again, just pure romantic ideology. The idea is, when I am in nature, I am closer to that energy, that essence that makes me human. And when I come face to face with that understanding, I'm reminded of what really matters. The world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending. Malls take us away from what we truly are. Malls somehow convince us that what we are is what we wear, what we are is what we buy, what we are is what we drive, and you can just continue. But Wordsworth will say, all of that makes no sense when you ask the simple question, who are you? And the answer for Wordsworth is, your energy. And once you remember that, you have the capacity to again find this mood of joy. Now all of that, will take us then to the future. And notice the break. I'm on page 788 now. And he will turn to his sister Dorothy. And it will be here now that he speaks not only to Dorothy, but he speaks to every young reader who ever picks up this poem. And clearly this, uh, uh, this poem is going to speak to a lot of young readers going forward. Nor perchance, if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay. Don't miss this line. He's again going to acquiesce and say, it may be the case I'm wrong. It may be the case that I'm kind of deluding myself. But if I were not going to have this position, my spirits would suffer decay. What does that mean? If I didn't think this way, my spirits would suffer decay. What does that mean? I would be what? Lost. Keep going. Lost. Keep going. Dead. Keep going. If I didn't believe this view about nature, my spirit would suffer decay. We have different language today. What do we say when someone's down all the time? They are suffering from what? Depression. You got it. This is his point. You have two options. You can live your life kind of depressed, or you can live your life with some sense of hope. He says if you want to live your, your life with some sense of hope, the way to do that is to follow this regimen that I am explicating here in this poem. Now to his sister, right? For thou art with me upon the banks of this fair river. What fair river? You saw it in the picture of yesterday, the river Y. The river Y, the river Y, right? That river Y runs right past Tenturn Abbey, as we saw in the pictures yesterday. And here is Dorothy now with him, the young girl. Notice he calls her his dearest friend, his dear, dear friend. And in thy voice, I catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. What does he say about Dorothy? Being around young people reminds him of what? He what he was like when he was young. It's interesting. The other day I heard a senior say, I cannot stand to go into that wretched middle school. Those kids have way too much energy. Well, that's one view of it. Another view of it is to say, yeah, going into a middle school reminds us of what you were six years ago. You could have a quick tendency to forget that. This is Wordsworth's insight, and it's a powerful one. As you age, you can quickly forget what it was like to be young. That is a monumental mistake. Some of you will report that that's the ma major mistake of the adults you, in your life. They are old now. They can't remember what it was like to be 18. So they've forgotten what it's like to be 18. And when you try and talk to them about what it's like to be 18, they want to lecture you on why you shouldn't be 18. When the reality is, you can't be anything but 18 when you're 18. When you get older, though, you quickly forget that. And you kind of try to unlearn or to completely forget what it is you were when you were that age at 18. You somehow try to imagine yourself as something different or something more when of course the truth of the matter is you aren't anything close to that. Wordsworth says I like being with someone younger because it reminds me of what I once was. Keep reading. 
He says, Oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I was once, my dear, dear sister. He wants to be able to hold on to what he was. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky, so was it when my life began. He wants to remember what it was like to be young because he's going already, he realizes I'm getting old. And then he makes a prayer. And obviously, let's put it in your notes. This is not only a prayer to his sister Dorothy, but this becomes the prayer to all readers who find this poem. What is the prayer that he makes to her? Knowing that nature, do you see it's capitalized? Not line 123. Knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Notice the personification of nature here. This almost sounds... Religious in nature. Wordsworth will take a lot of heat for that fact, right? Some people will, of course, out of the Romantic tradition, call nature Mother Nature in an attempt to, again, try to personify in some way this force. Nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Tis her privilege, nature. Through all our years of this, our life, to lead us from joy to joy. This is an interesting argument that he will make again. People are not born with happy moods. No. People are not born. You know, whether it's just some people who are just in a good mood all the time, and that's not me. No. Wordsworth says that is not the origin of your good mood or bad mood. That is not the origin of your enthusiasm. That is not the origin of your energy. Your energy comes from nature, but you make a choice to recognize that or not. If you refuse to recognize that, your spirit suffered decay. That is to say crappy moods, bad energy, no enthusiasm. On the other hand, if you embrace the fact that you are energy, Wordsworth says you go from joy to joy. For nature, look at what he says about nature, can so inform, that means teach, the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty. Notice those are two terms that often end up in that second box of Plato's right form theory. And so feed with, uh oh, now it's not elevated thoughts, but lofty thoughts that neither, and here's an interesting list. Dude, I cannot tell you much about your future life, but I can predict all the things he's about to list will at some point happen to you in the next 10 years. This is a depressing list, but it's a real list. This, see, here's the thing. Wordsworth is no blind romantic. Oh, everything is great. Quite the opposite. He's telling his sister when she's young, you ain't going to be happy forever, naive, the world is great, everything is wonderful, not going to be like that. What will, what will the future be like? Well, here's your list. Sorry about this, but I can predict this for you as well. The bottom of 788, the top of 789. For neither, that neither evil tongues, people are going to talk nasties about you. Rash judgments, you're going to make some stupid decisions in the next 10, ten uh, years. <laughs> Nor the sneers of selfish men, that is to say, people will be jealous of you at times and try and make you feel bad. Nor greetings where no kindness is, we know all about that because we know our Shakespeare, when people are going to pretend like they're nice to you, and then the minute you turn around, they're going to try and do something terrible to you. That's coming. The dreary intercourse of daily life, there it is in a line. That will be, for a good number of you, the essence of what it means to be in college for many, many of your days. The dreary intercourse of daily life. Notice he says about all of those things, that none of those shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings. He says, I have made a conscious choice. To look at the world as a place in spite of all the terrible things. By the way, this is another kind of theodicy, isn't it? Notice Wordsworth does not disagree with the fact the child's dying of leukemia in the bed. He doesn't try to console the mother by giving her some theological argument about Adam and Eve in a garden eating from fruit. That's not his theodicy. His theodicy is, I made a choice. And the choice is, about anything that happens, I'm going to accept it as part of nature. And because I accept it as part of nature, I'm not going to get real upset about it. That is a conscious choice. That's foundational as well to the romantic ideology. Notice, he says, therefore, 
let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk. He predicts for his sister, you're going to feel alone a lot of the time going forward. And let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee. And in after years, when you get old, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure. It is fascinating to teach in the same room for a long time. Here's why. Because I saw them when they were 16, 17, 18, and then I get to see them when they're 40, and they're raising kids of their own. And they come in for parent-teacher conferences, right? And in a moment, I can remember them as they appeared in their senior photograph from high school, but they don't look that way anymore when they show up, and they ain't the same person anymore because they got kids, right? Right, and here's the and here's the uh, here's the future, right? That he says when your when your wild ecstasies are calm, because as you get older, that's just what happens, right? Shall be matured into a sober pleasure. When thy mind shall be a mansion for all. Uh oh, he uses the word intentionally. Those of us who read our Plato, we do not miss this, right? The uh, mansion for all lovely. There's the word, right? Do you see it? Forms. Thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and, uh-oh, he uses the word again, harmonies. Musicians, of course, love this poem because he keeps coming back to this idea that all of life is like either being a tuned piano or an untuned piano. And you get to decide. You get to decide whether your life is a tuned piano or an untuned piano. You're the one that makes the decision. Notice he gives this list one more time. He's a realist. He wants Dorothy and all young readers of this poem to know bad stuff is coming. Don't be shocked when this list happens to you. Oh, then if solitude, you're going to feel really alone. Or fear, you're going to feel a lot of anxiety. Or pain or grief should be thy portion with what, look at the word healing thoughts of tender joy. Wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations. For romantics, the only sin is to forget. Forget what? Well, in this case, exhortations. Here's what I'm telling you. The world is an amazing place. You'll have a tendency to forget that over and over and over. You can remember it much better if you just get in your car, drive out to the Badlands and sit for an hour. Or if you get in your car and drive up to the mountains all the way. Think of the advantage you have as students who live here to be able to do this quite easily, right? You've seen those Winnebago's pulled over to the side of the road taking photographs of, what, antelope or the mountains or something, right? But see, some of you will go way far away to school where you won't have the advantage of doing that. And it will be in those moments in the city, remember that's where Wordsworth said he got stuck, that you don't have the ability to just jump in your car, drive up to the hill for you know 30 minutes away and sit there. But when you do that, when you go to your place, whether we go there literally or in our minds, it will help us to remember the, and have those healing thoughts. Nor perchance if I should be where I can no more hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, wilt thou then... Forget, don't forget, he says, that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together and that I, so long a worshiper of nature, do you see it's capitalized? So long a worshiper of nature came hither, unwearied in that service, rather say with, war with warmer love, with far deeper zeal of holier love, nor wilt thou then forget. Notice he keeps saying this, don't forget, don't forget, right? Which is ironic because, it, yeah, it is true in years past. I've had seniors memorize this poem. And although they will report afterwards, I don't remember all of the lines. I remember a number of the lines of this poem, especially because he kept saying it. Don't forget, don't forget. It is easy to forget what you were like. I could do this game with you right now at 3B and show you how much of your life you've forgotten. Some of you would begin to think you're losing your mind. When I would ask you simple questions about the last 10 years of your life, of course, 10 years ago to the day, where were you? So you do quick mathematics. That's why we number our grades. You're in grade 12. 10 years ago put you in grade... See how that works? And all of a sudden, I can begin to ask you about second grade. And it's interesting... Think of this. It's interesting what immediately comes to mind, right? 
And if I wanted to, I could take time to begin to walk you through it. I'd start asking you questions, and quite frankly, you'd be like, you know, I can't remember that anymore. It's, it, that's just the way the human mind works. We kind of have this tendency to forget. Wordsworth says, there are certain things, though, you don't want to forget by virtue of, uh, you know, your, your future life, trying to find good energy or whatever. Notice he comes back one more time. The steep woods, the lofty cliffs, the green pastoral landscape were to me more dear both for themselves and for thy sake. In other words, he says, every time I come back to a spot like this, it becomes more precious for me. That is to say, this is a poem of place. Now, Wordsworth, of course, is uh, going to have written much more than Tintern Abbey. This is just becomes his, his uh, baseline poem. If you know Tintern Abbey, then you know everything else. So, for example, I can say it this way. Uh, the world is too much with us late and soon is cliff notes for Tintern Abbey. Now that you know Tintern Abbey, it's pretty easy to go to that poem and say, I totally get it. The world is too much with us late and soon means what? We spend way too much time focused on what? Well, getting and spending. And when we do that, what happens? We lay waste our powers, little we see capital in, in nature that is ours, we somehow have convinced ourselves, this is bizarre for Wordsworth and other romantics, we've convinced ourselves we're somehow different from Ruthie's tree because we can cut down Ruthie's tree. As if somehow or another, being able to cut that tree down makes you somehow different from that tree. But that's only because you forget that just like Ruthie's tree, you also get cut down. The only difference between you and a fly is that you know about fly swatters. Right? Fly swatters are something you know about. Flies don't know about fly swatters. You could make the argument flies are far happier than you. They just fly around until all of a sudden, you know a fly swatter's coming. Think about how much more difficult that is. Every day you get up, a fly swatter's coming. Is it today? You know it's coming. You don't get to go to 200 years. You know it's coming. You know it's coming for everyone you love, for everyone you live with. And yet when you look at those people, you rarely think that at all. Why? Because you somehow think you're different from Ruthie's tree. I can cut down Ruthie's tree, therefore I'm different from Ruthie's tree. Wordsworth says, yeah, the world is too much with us late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We've given our hearts away. Later he will say, nature moves us not. We're out of tune. We have no sense of how to connect anymore with the things that really matter. Now, this is, of course, Wordsworth's critique especially of the Industrial Revolution. Getting and spending is all about making money. And he says, in the process of making money and trying to make money and power, we lose ourselves. Westminster Bridge is a poem, uh, a, a brief little sonnet that he wrote in 1802. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would be he of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty this city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning, the city of, of London. I, I like to point out this poem because some people say, well, romantics are always about being in the country and never in the city. Not so. This poem is an outright celebration of the city in the morning before anybody else is awake. By the way, I should point out, you will remember this from your study of another romantic named uh, Thoreau, that Thoreau once said in Walden, I can't look people in the face who don't get up early in the morning because they're half dead all their day. Getting up in the early morning before everyone else gets up and there's no movement is for Thoreau foundational to attaching again to the, to the energy that will sustain him through his day. Wordsworth believed the same thing. He liked to get up in the early morning and go for these walks and he writes this poem after he takes a look at London. Um, over to I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, this is going to be a poem of two parts. The first is just a description of a million daffodils on the side of a mountain next to the ocean. You will appreciate this, most of you anyway, will appreciate this more if I were to say, you know in the spring here in a couple of days when you drive up onto the mountain and all the wildflowers are in complete bloom? You know how you do that and you kind of come over a hill and all of a sudden it's like the entire mountain seems alive with all the different colors of flowers? That's kind of the same thing. Take a look at how he plays this game. I wonder, lonely as a cloud that floats on high or veils in here and, and hills, and all at once... I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched a never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The meadow, 
thousands of yellow daffodils and then the ocean out beyond it. A powerful, a powerful image in his mind. The waves beside, him, uh, beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves and glee. The, the flowers, because they're moving with the breeze, uh, looks like they're dancing, right? A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. This will now sound very much like Tintern Abbey. I told you, if you know Tintern, you know all of his poems. But oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood. What is a pensive mood? Does anyone know that mood? If, if you ask your pal, you, you seem, you seem kind of, something's wrong. Oh, I'm just in a pensive mood. What does that mean? Pensive means what? This is Wally's hands. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. This is worry, pensive is worry. Anxiety, oh no, oh no, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Now that I know what I'm gonna do, what college am I gonna go to? What will, I, what will happen then, what will happen then? I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, you know, Wordsworth will point out, we spend all of our life thinking about tomorrow and forget it never really gets here. You never get to tomorrow, it's always today. You never make it to tomorrow, it's always today. And that's all that there is. But we spend most of our today thinking about tomorrow. What will I do? What will I do? What will happen? What will happen? That's this pensive mood thing. He says, when I'm stuck at home on, 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 my, on my couch in a pensive mood, notice he says these daffodils flash upon that inward eye. What is the inward eye? We know what the outward eye is. What's the inward eye? The, the imagination. Remember, Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. That's the greatest scientist of the 20th century. And he said, everyone's into knowledge. Knowledge is nothing compared to imagination. Wordsworth would have agreed. Flash to that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. He's able to come back to a single moment hold on to that moment, and it gets him through the wretchedness of his existence or the pensiveness of his existence. All right, so there you go. An introduction to the first of our great Generation One poets, uh, Wordsworth. Now what I want to do is I want to shift, and I want to take us to the work of William Blake. I'll begin this lecture now. I will finish it on Monday as we prep for our examination coming. We're going to begin with you on page uh, 754 now, 754. And we want to talk a little bit about another Generation One poet named Blake, all right? William Blake. The thing that's important for our discussion of Blake, and you'll want this in your notes right away, is that Blake writes two sets of poems, okay? Two sets of poems. He actually titles them two different names. One he calls songs. He doesn't call it poems, he calls them songs. One he calls Songs of Innocence. And then the other collection of poems he calls Songs of Experience. And he publishes them side by side. And he does a lot of these little drawings that he includes in the finished product. And those drawings become really famous. For example, on 759, that is the facsimile page from Songs of Experience for his famous poem, The Tiger. Okay? Um, when you look, for example, over on 763, you see another one of his drawings on 763. When you look over on 764, you can see another one of his drawings there. Okay? So you get a sense of these little drawings. He was an artist as well as a writer, okay? Now let's begin by asking for your notes. Jot down, what is the difference for you between innocence and experience? Derive an operational definition of those two terms. Ms. Damiano, how would you define innocence? Define that word for us. Innocence. What is innocence? Uncorrupt, good, let's write that one down. Uncorrupt, what do you think, Kennedy? Innocence. Honesty. Honest, we think of honesty and innocence going together. What else? Innocence. Naive. Let's write that one down. What does naive mean? 
innocent? It does, but what does that mean? A naive, innocent, in what way innocent? Kind of stupid. stupid, let's write it down. You're really pretty stupid, aren't you? I mean, let's say it this way. You just don't know stuff, right? So you show up at Worland High School as the little freshman. Yay! This is going to be so much fun, right? Yeah. Uh, right? See how that works? Okay. Innocence. Stupidity. Ignorance. Uncertainty about the future. Right? What about experience then? Jot that one down. What's the difference? What do you think? What is experience? Knowing, Knowing things. Uh-oh. We almost always have to equate knowledge with experience, huh? Knowledge if we, equate, if we equate stupidity, ignorance, with innocence, we normally equate knowledge with experience. Right? You've done something that others who are labeled as innocent have not done. Our instincts, of course, are almost always to think sexual in these terms of innocence and experience. Of course, no, no doubt, that's a powerful metaphor for us. But let's point out the ways in your notes in which it's not just sexual, it's in, it's in any number of other ways as well. There is a difference between innocence and experience. The question, of course, is a simple one. Which is better? Which is better? Is it better to be innocent? Childlike? Naive? Or is it better to be experienced, knowledgeable, wise. Hmm. Now Blake is really intrigued by this question because he loves Paradise Lost. What? I just made a 3A observation. Blake loves Paradise Lost. And he's thoroughly convinced that Paradise Lost is often misread by lots of people. He thinks the most important element of Paradise Lost is this question. When are Adam and Eve better off? Before? When they're in the garden? Innocence or experience? When you're in the garden. Innocence. Innocence right? La-ti-da. Everything is great. Whatever we want, we got. We don't feel any shame. We don't feel any fear. We don't feel any stress. Everything is awesome, right? Or are Adam and Eve far, far happier once they no longer are in Eden? No. Our instincts are to say, no way. Of course they can't be happier once they're thrown out of the perfect place. Blake says, go back and read Paradise Lost again. There almost seems to be a willful Adam's willful, Eve's willful desire to leave Eden. Well, they're holding hands again, so... They are holding hands at the end of the poem as they leave, off into the great world of adventure. Any adventures in Eden? Why aren't there any adventures in Eden? I mean, in a state of innocence. Why are there no adventures in a state of innocence? There's no fear, right? If there's no fear, there's no adventure. I ask athletes all the time, what kind of a game would it be if you knew when you played it, you knew absolutely 100% that you were going to win? Like, for example, the, the, the rules are rigged or there's cheating involved or whatever, so you know you're going to win. Is there any adventure to a game like that? It's kind of boring. Repetitive. Same thing. Over and over and over but wait a minute, are we saying Adam and Eve are better off after they sin? Well, that seems to be opposed to our theological views entirely. That's the whole point of the story. Of man's, remember the opening line of the poem of Milton's Paradise Lost? Of man's first what? Yeah, and when Milton uses the word disobedience, he's not doing it like this. Yay, disobey, that's awesome, that's what they did. No, it's disobey as in... Sad. Right? Blake has a really intriguing question. Which, which is better for you? When you don't know anything, innocence, or when you have 